Um, do we have the remote or is somebody going to? Yep, this is it. Okay, all right. So let's get to the first slide. And is it possible to turn off this first bank of lights so to be able to see a little better? Yep. All right, so while they're getting that um, set up, I just wanted to thank you guys for coming. I mean, you have a choice in how you spend your evenings if you've chosen to come here, and we really appreciate that. Um, so part of what I want to do here today is not just tell you about my own experiences and why I think space is a good idea. I want to get you guys inspired to really think of space as a, very, a viable entrepreneurship option. So the world is changing now. We are in a very different place from where we were even like three years ago. You know what Elon Musk is doing. There are a lot of other companies out there that are doing some amazing things. And um, I know that a lot of people here that I've spoken to are working on some innovative technologies for planet Earth. And it's not that hard, here's the last words, not that hard to be able to space qualify that, to get your technology into orbit. And um, people are doing this globally. There are a thousand space related startups globally today. Um, and they, they're planning in three years that's going to be 10,000. That's, that's crazy, right? And so if you have a technology that you want to put into space, um, if we don't start doing this here in Singapore, somebody else will. And you know, there are countries, I mean, Vietnam's launching satellites in Southeast Asia. There are companies with very small economies that are actually starting to do this stuff. And I think it's time for us to catch up. And not only just catch up, but become a hub for R&D for this part of the world. So can we go to the first, I'll oh, see if I can back it up. Okay, there we go. So. Um, that's Mars, that's a Singaporean flag. I photoshopped that myself. My TA daughter was very proud of me for that. So what we're gonna do here is um, just talk about getting from laptop to launch pad. My husband actually did the one on the right, he's sitting right up here too, um, so it's a family affair. So we're gonna talk about the idea that you have up here and how you get that into space. Um, so let's talk about traditional space, which was big and expensive and really amazing, but really inaccessible to most of us. I mean, if you live in this part of the world and you want to have a career with NASA, or with ESA, or the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, it's, it's pretty hard to do. There's citizenship issues, and just lack of access to the right kind of, of training. So um, back in the day with traditional space, my first job was on the Hubble Space Telescope, which is down here on the bottom right. And then Commander Williams here was on the space shuttle, and he was also on the International Space Station. And both, all of these are multiple billion dollar missions, right? So then we have the space station here, and then um, if you can see it, the Mars rover, I worked on that, and then Galileo um, at Jupiter, did my PhD with that. So I was very privileged to be in a place where I had access to this. I had professors at my university who had collaborators at NASA, and I did some research with my professors, and through them, I got to the point where I could work on these um, huge projects. But you know they're awesome, but they're hard to actually um, put your mind around because none of us has a few billion dollars unless you're Elon Musk. So this is new space. This we're in a new paradigm right now. Um, so when you think about your cell phone, everybody's got their phone. Think about the com computing power in that phone, right? That computing power, power in that tiny hand phone is equivalent to a, sort of a huge um, desktop computer from say 15, 20 years ago, right? And in the same way that we've had miniaturization of electronics for computers, we've had miniaturization of technology for space. How many of you guys have heard of a CubeSat here? Oh, cool, a bunch of people. All right, so for those who haven't, I'll just tell you, a CubeSat is a self-contained small satellite. It does everything the big ones do, but it costs about as much as a nice car in Singapore to launch, quarter million, three hundred thousand dollars So, I mean, it's, it's not crazy, and the price will only go down. And this is actually a CubeSat, right here. 1.3 kgs, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. This is one that we actually use to train with for our workshops. It's not radiation hardened. Uh, we just use this for training um, on a desktop system, and it's got a little camera in here. You can put in whatever you want. Um, it's just amazing. This, amazing. this has been a game changer. So the other game changer has been launches. So up there on the top right, you see a couple of different rockets. Um, SpaceX, we all know that SpaceX is doing amazing things, launching and then landing again. But then there are um, other countries too, like in India, the Indian Space Agency has a spin-off now that does launches. It's a commercial company and they're making a lot of money. They just launched 104 of these at once back in February. So the ability to get your stuff up into space has significantly changed as well. 
Um, so we've got the Thai Space Agency, the Malaysian Space Agency. Um, we don't have a Singaporean Space Agency, but that shouldn't stop us in the private sector. Um, so just there are a ton of things you can do in space with satellites. One thing I'll just tell you about is um, the smoke from fires. Right now, the big satellites that are up there get data with whatever cadence the satellite company decides. That can be every two or three days, and if you're talking about a fire like this, it would be fantastic to be able to get an infrared image within two hours of it starting. So you can, if you're consistently taking images, you see something, you can go in and you know, hold the fire back before it spreads, because two or three days is just too late, right? So that's just one, um, one example, and I'm happy to talk about other examples with you guys. You can come up afterwards. So um, New Space in Singapore, what do we do here? So, um, so we've got the incubator, which we're starting out, and one of the issues we're finding is um, training. So people think that they can't do space because they don't have a degree in space engineering. Right? I, mean, I have a degree in space physics, but I was in a country that where they actually offered that as, as a diploma. But what I want you guys to think about is everybody who's in this room has the capacity to work in space. Anything that you're doing with hardware, software, you know, even stuff for human spaceflight, you know, sociology, psychology, all of that is going to be necessary in the next decade or so to work in space tech. There's a website called spacenews.com that you can follow, and there's um, constantly stuff going on in the commercial space sector that people just don't really think about here. Um, so the things that we're doing here to help people come up to speed are we're giving the workshops like this that I talked about with this. Set. We've got one on Saturday. If you go to the website, bsc-space.com, you can see that. And the other thing that we do, and this is where we connect with Commander Williams, is we do experiments on the International Space Station. So this June, the first ever Singaporean experiment was launched to the International Space Station with SpaceX and this company, NanoRax. And you can see the astronauts are up there. So the students build these modules, and the astronauts plug them in. And this is one of the things that Commander Williams did when he was up in space, was working on research and development. And so your experiment will sit up there, depending on the kind of experiment you have, and then they bring it back down for you. And in our case, the students launched a bunch of bacteria up there because they wanted to study the effects of bacteria, uh, of, of space and on bacteria, which I think is kind of amazing. When I was that age, if I had actually been able to do that, I mean, it just would have been fantastic. So we have, the, for the next year, for the next round, we have a company, um, we have a, a school here in Singapore that's doing this, and we also have a group in Australia, and we're looking to build out beyond that as well. So this is one of my favorite pictures ever. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but the um, Dragon capsule from SpaceX that took us up there, left us there, and then we came back down a month later. This is a picture taken by an astronaut from the space station after the Dragon that was re-entering Earth was unreleased. You see the robot arm? And then just down here, that is um, the Dragon capsule with our experiment on it re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. That is so cool. And I have this in high resolution, everybody wants it. It's my screen background on my computer. You can see the Earth's atmosphere there, and you can see the starlight behind it. And if you look at this, um, sort of close and better resolution, it's just so cool. So um, just very quickly, let me talk about the areas where I think, this is my opinion, that we're going to be making lots of progress in the next decade or so. Um, we can start on your right with the Google Lunar X Prize. So the Google Lunar X Prize is a $20 million award to the first private team, no government money, private team that goes to the moon, lands on the moon, travels 500 meters, and sends back live video. So there are four teams that are actually um, have reservations on rockets to do this right now. One from the US, um, two from Asia, one so there's an Indian and Japanese, um, two separate payloads on one rocket, and then we've got another one from Israel. And the plan is to have them launch by the end of this year if they want the prize. So if they're able to launch on schedule, um, you are going to get live video feed from the moon on your phone. The, the whole point of the prize is to send back live video. And you think about that, whether it happens in this, this December, last I read they were thinking about slipping in a few months, or whether it happens a year from now, that is going to be a game changer. In terms of our concept of the democratization of space, the concept of access to space, Every 13-year-old kid with the phone is going to be looking at live video from the moon. So I, you know, I really think I really want to encourage you guys to get on board because all this stuff is coming and it's, it's real. So we talk about asteroid mining too. Um, asteroids are very pristine. You don't have to go in and remove the minerals the way you would with um, mines here on Earth. There hasn't been geological pro um, processing on asteroids, so it's fairly easy to extract stuff. And there are websites 
that will tell you how much material is on an asteroid and how much it's worth. Because from the ground, we know how big they are. We know what they're made of. And so you can look at current market prices and figure out how much a rock is worth. So you can spend tens of millions going up there, but if you're bringing back a billion dollars worth of very rare material, uh, you're going to come out ahead. And of course, there's uh, Elon Musk's dream of colonizing Mars. And the reason I'm bringing all these things up is we here can provide software, we can provide subsystems. Everything that has to be done in space um, has to be done on Earth. So a lot of the software, IoT, the sensor systems, everything that you guys work on here, a lot of the entrepreneurs around here, that stuff can be converted into space tech. And so I'm hoping that you guys do think about that. All right, so um, so the theme here is the Singapore can be a global space, a global hub for space R&D. Um, we have a few events coming up. The rest of this week, we've got talks for Commander Williams. We're very excited to have him here. Um, and then we have a workshop on Saturday that I mentioned, and we have a meetup group called Singapore Astropreneurs. I see some familiar faces. Maybe some of you guys have come. We usually meet over Box 79, then we go to Timber Plus and have beers and talk about the latest in space tech. Um, and then the United Nations has a World Space Week every year in October, and for the second year this time year, we're also participating. That's more public outreach and talks for you know just like the general public. So um, I think that's it. If you want to load up. Commander's talk. Um, so while they load that up, um, let me just tell you a couple things about him. He is a fantastic speaker. He's got an amazing video. He's spent 534 days in space. He's done spacewalks. And this is the real deal. It's such a privilege for us to have him here. And I'm really excited. And I guess I'll just introduce you now and let you tell us what it's like to be in space.